This is the Japanese Automatic Transmission Company's JR710E 7-speed automatic transmission. The donor vehicle is a 2012 Nissan Infiniti G25 with 23,000 miles on it. What we're going to do is go ahead and uh, disassemble this transmission. This transmission has been disassembled before. It's uh, absolutely clean. There's no transmission fluid. Everything will come apart very quickly and very easily. And the first thing to do is to position the transmission in such a way that we can start disassembling it. And we want to start by removing the uh, transmission pan and the valve body. Obviously, when removing the transmission pan, an uh, air tool would be just fine. A electric impact would be just fine. Here I'm just simply using a speed handle. These are 10 millimeter bolts. Now I torque to probably about maybe 9 to 12 foot pounds, not much, as this is small fastener. On the Affinity 7AT, the only way to check fluid is with the engine running through the standpipe, which we'll see in just a moment, and to add fluid. The easiest way to do is just simply add it through the standpipe. Now obviously you'll need some type of uh, fluid pump. Okay, here we go. 23 and now uh, 24 hand bolts. Now, even though the 7AT does have the means with which to uh, utilize a dipstick, is that many vehicles there is no dipstick. So the method of checking the fluid is through the standpipe, filling the transmission is through the standpipe, and then of course obviously we have a drain plug. Now we're ready to remove the valve body. Start out the F output shaft speed sensor. Plugs in here to the park neutral switch. Just simply squeeze the connector gently. Put this off to the side. Now, when we remove the valve body, it's very important that you realize that the uh, connector is going to want to follow the valve body out. So there's a clip on the connector. Be sure to remove that clip. Alright, when we're removing the valve body bolts, retaining the valve body to the case, only certain bolts need to be removed. And it seems like um, JATCO, in their wisdom, decided to use all kinds of different lengths. Sometimes it's a little confusing keeping them straight, but one basic rule of thumb is just simply as you place the bolts there should be a uniform height between the head of the bolt and the valve body. Obviously if I have a long bolt where a medium bolt belongs the bolt will extend much further out of the valve body. So as I take these off if I look in their correct locations they all should be about the same height. Now as I actually pull the bolts, you'll notice that there are a variety of different lengths. Now obviously I could look at the manual and get a little legend as where the uh, bolts actually belong, which would be fine. 
But here, this is a quick way to simply check. Now again, a 10 millimeter bolt is not going to be torqued excessively. Oftentimes, a transmission rebuilder's best friend is a speed handle. And removing these, an electric impact would be fine, or an air impact. But actually installing it, I want to make sure that uh, we don't <coughs> damage any threads or over torque our fasteners. Okay, so we'll go ahead and as if we look, if we can get a side shot and kind of look up here at the valve body, we can actually see that sure enough, all of the bolts kind of extend a uniform height from the valve body. But as I pull these bolts, you'll notice that they're all different lengths. All kinds of different lengths. Now obviously if I put a long bolt where a short one belongs, it's pretty obvious. That bolt definitely does not belong there. I'm ready to remove the valve body and again don't forget to remove the clip from the connector and I'm actually going to reach under here and I'm going to squeeze the connector make sure it's clean and maybe a little penetrating oil a little WD-40 wouldn't help to kind of coax it out and then it should just lift right off and what's re resisting me is the connector right there Now, as we take a look at the 7AT valve body, we see on the top, this is actually the transmission control module. The output shaft speed sensor is mounted here in the case, and here is the connector. We'll see that in just a moment. Hall effect switch, they're looking at the uh, parking gear. Uh, here we see the two input speed sensors, and here's the actual TCM. This is a Hitachi model. There we see the processor and the cover for the assortment of solenoids. We'll disassemble and go through the valve body in a separate video. Now, let's get back to the transmission. Now, usually the easiest way to disassemble this is to go ahead and start at the output end. Now, somewhat heavy. Okay, usually the best way to start disassembling the 7AT is to go ahead and remove the 11 extension housing bolts. Obviously this is a rear wheel drive unit. Now, <coughs> obviously when you're disassembling the transmission, these uh, 14 millimeter bolts are going to be torqued to a fairly stiff torque, probably around 35, 40 foot pounds. So here, a electric impact would be warranted to go ahead and zip them out. After removing the 11 extension housing bolts, we'll go ahead and remove the extension housing. Now, it's actually going to be sealed with an anaerobic sealer. So you're going to have to take a rubber mallet and give it a little pop in order to take it loose. Of course, be gentle. Get kind of an upward motion. And then here we go. And here we see the parking pole, the parking mechanism. Here we see the output shaft speed sensor. Here we see a Torrington bearing and race that's uh, retained to the case there with some of the <coughs> assembly lube. Here on the output shaft we see the 
selective spacer and bearing brace, part of the Torrington bearing. And here we have the output shaft. Now I'm going to be able to grab it and lift it right out. Now, make sure the transmission is level. If the transmission is laid down horizontal or at an angle, you will not be able to put the output shaft back in. You can certainly pull it out, but you won't be able to put it back in. The transmission must be level. So, here I have the output shaft. And here we see the parking gear. Here we see the Torrington thrust bearing. And you want to pay close attention to the orientation. And obviously this is retained with lubrication um, <clears throat> with assembly lube. And we want to make sure that we go ahead and remove The output speed sensor. Simply a 10 millimeter bolt. Slip it right through the case. Now at this time also, I'm going to be laying the transmission up on end. And so I want to make sure that I don't damage my manual linkage or my parking mechanism. So this would be a good time to go ahead and remove the detent roller. And it's pretty obvious how the parking li linkage is assembled. And there at the extreme end I'm able to go ahead and remove it there from the rooster comb and my manual valve linkage. Now I'm ready to go ahead and reposition the transmission up on end. Okay here we're getting ready to remove the bell housing and the front pump. One thing that uh, Jatco has done with their 7-speed automatic is that the bell housing bolts to the case. So it allows me to uh, use a variety of different bell housing configurations for different engines. First thing I want to do is go ahead and remove the bell housing. 14 millimeter bolt. They are a different length than both the pump and the extension housing, so there shouldn't be any problem confusing them. It's a good idea though to keep all of your bolts separated. Keep them together. Now obviously this transmission has been apart, so I can just simply use a speed handle to take these fasteners loose. Obviously though, uh, first time you're going to need to use your electric impact. Now, the bell housing will come off and just here in just a moment, sometimes a little tap with the uh, rubber mallet, give it a slight encouragement to come loose, but after the bolts are out, you should be ready to come off. And these are steel bolts steel bolts into aluminum. And again, like I say, the bell housing's already been off once, so she lifts off without any problem at all. Now we're ready to remove the pump bolts. One thing that you will notice from JATCO, you see that there is a silicone thread sealer on each one of these bolts. So obviously when overhauling this transmission, I want to carefully clean that and freshen it. Don't get carried away, but obviously that's going to be a critical component there to prevent a front pump leak. 
as we rebuild the unit. And again, first time disassembling the transmission, I'm actually using an electric impact. Here it's been apart already, so the speed handle works very nicely. Now, of course, I'm taking these pump bolts loose, but I'm going to <clears throat> be very sorry if I don't first remove this uh, torque converter clutch o-ring on the turbine shaft before I try and pull this pump up. So make darn sure that you remove that o-ring and it's a good idea go ahead and put the o-ring with the pump bolts to make sure that you're reminded that as you reassemble the transmission don't forget to put that o-ring back. That uh, converter clutch is going to have some strange behavior and may even chatter by simply failing to reinstall that torque converter clutch o-ring there on the turbine shaft. And as you can see the pump bolt and the bell housing bolt very different lengths. No chance of confusing those. You'll notice the silicone from Chatco. This transmission has never been disassembled before it came to us. And the infamous O-ring. One advantage with these uh, textured rubber gloves is they give you a much better grip than your bare hands would, especially wet with transmission fluid. So you'll notice that I'm able to very gently just squeeze the O-ring and lift it right up. Now, obviously this pump's been out. It's well lubricated. However, for the first time, it would be a real good idea to use the slide hammers to go ahead and remove the pump. Also, there's another reason for it too, is it actually gives you a handle to hold it as you remove it. Now, Sure, you could reach in here with a screwdriver and maybe pry on something, but chances are you might tear something up. And as we'll see in a moment, there's a snap ring that's retaining our roller clutch. So we'll be careful not to damage that. So the simplest, easiest method is just simply use the slide hammer. Doesn't take much. And off she goes. Okay, here we see the pump, front pump assembly, and here we see the front brake clutch piston and the uh, 2346 clutch. So here we see the brake clutch, 2346, and front brake piston. Now you'll notice that one of the races of my front Torrington bearing is uh, attached here to the stator support there with assembly loom. This is one of those selective shims. And I also have a critical sealing ring and this is actually for the seal lubrication pressure there to direct it correctly within the transmission. You'll notice that I'm using a Torrington bearing to support the turbine shaft there in the back. And you'll notice I do not have any type of bushing or bearing at all there in the front for the turbine shaft. That's going to be <coughs> critical that a, the torque converter is going to support that. We do not have any type of gasket there in the case between the pump housing and the case. We do have this o-ring which is a critical sealing member. Now we'll go ahead and set this here and as we disassemble the transmission it's very easy to just simply take the members of the gear train and just stack them right there on the pump. This allows you to keep track of all of your thrush washers, their orientation, the clutches, 
etc. So now let's move back over here to the transmission. Here I'm just simply using a magnet to pick up the front clutch steel plates. Now there's a certain orientation this much go in the case and it really will only go in one way. I see the steel, friction, steel, friction, steel. Okay, here we have to remove the snap ring for the F1 roller clutch. The orientation is not critical there within the transmission. However, as we disassembled this transmission for the first time, the opening was there towards the top of the case. All right, now that we've done that, What's easy to do now is just simply grab the turbine shaft and give it a slight lift here, and up we go. And now what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to go ahead and carefully remove all my components and stack them over here on the pump. Keeps everything together. You'll notice that the uh, F1 roller clutch is indeed truly a roller clutch. Okay, here we're going to go ahead and disassemble the front section. Here we see the front sun gear, actually two sun gears, two sets of planetaries, two sets of internal gears. The sun gear is going to be locked to the case by the 2346 brake. And you'll notice that I have the Torrington bearing and its selective race there in the correct position. All right, here we're going to go ahead and pick up the F1 roller clutch and the <coughs> front planetary assembly. You'll notice here is a reluctor ring for the one of the input speed sensors. And I'll go ahead and check that my Torrington bearing is retained with assembly lube correctly oriented oriented and here we see the F1 clutch and this of course prevents the roller clutch from overrunning And of course reassembling it like this is totally unnecessary. This is just to keep it oriented so I can stack it up here on the bench and uh, effectively talk about it. Of course, this snap ring is going to retain the roller clutch. All right, let's go ahead and move to our next assembly. Now, this is actually a sub-assembly. 
So we actually have the input clutch and we see the front internal gear, we have the input internal gear, and we also have the second set of planetaries. And here is what the JATCO is calling their input clutch. Now, what I'm going to do is let me go ahead and just Put a little assembly lube to retain my Torrington thrust bearing, and I'm just going to go ahead and set this down on the pump housing. Come back to it here in just a moment. All right, let's move back over to the case. Here I have another one of my Torrington bearings. Now, this is actually the output planetary. And this is the sole output member on JATCO 7AT transmission. As you can see, this splines directly to the output shaft. There it goes. Very tight splines. Very robust and heavy duty. Okay, so here we're going to go ahead and remove. This is the uh, P3 Planetary's internal gear. P3 planetary is actually the member that's going to be splined to the output shaft. Here we see the member that's going to be uh, splined. Okay. All right, now we're ready to lift out the high and low reverse clutch. And right behind that is the direct clutch. One thing nice about uh, JATCO's uh, frictions is they line up fairly easily when putting the transmission back together. These frictions are soaked with transmission fluid, and it seems to help because it kind of holds them steady. Want to make sure that uh, you have the correct orientation of each of the Torrington thrust washers. I'm just simply reassembling the unit here on the back. All right. Now as we move to our next section, this is going to be the reverse brake clutch. And there's a stout snap ring that's going to be, of course, retaining this, uh, the clutch pack and then the actual center support itself. So we'll go ahead and just simply use a screwdriver to remove the snap ring. I don't believe the orientation is critical, but in this particular unit, the snap ring's opening was there towards the top. Okay, and removing the snap ring, we were mentioning the orientation doesn't really seem to be critical. However, this that was uh, more towards the top. And usually what happens if I just simply bring it out of the groove, I can just simply pick it up. And there we go.
Now, here on this particular application, the 7AT has two of these anti rattle springs. Now, if you left this out, it wouldn't be the end of the world, and the customer, he may not even know it or ever complain. Or if he did hear the sound, he wouldn't know what it was. But basically, what this is for is it keeps the steels up there tight against the housing. So it just keeps them from rocking back and forth. That's all, and just making a clunking noise. Back in the olden days of the General Motors Hydromatic 350, they also used a similar device. And as I remove this clutch pack, don't forget to remove the anti-rattle spring. Now, as we look at the clutch pack, you'll notice that uh, I have a dished apply plate. And uh, in the form of the dish, the dish is actually forcing facing down. That is, the it's hard to see there on the camera, but what happens is we are looking at this. Here we see the dish, the bottom of the dish is going to be down towards the apply piston. And this is the reverse brake clutch. And here we see its anti-rattle spring. Okay, here we see the reverse brake clutch housing. And it's going to be retained by not only a tapered snap ring, which we'll remove in just a moment, but also by three T45 bolts. Now remember, these T4, uh, T45 bolts are actually going into an aluminum assembly. So let's be careful with the torque. Don't get carried away. It's probably coming in at no more than probably 9 to 13 foot-pounds. All three bolts are the same length. One thing by removing the parking linkage, the manual valve is free to move, or the manual linkage is free to move, so it gets out of the way if you were to set the case down, face down on the bench. Here we go. All three the same length with captured washer. Okay, now here as we get ready to remove the center support and the reverse clutch piston housing, uh, first thing we got to do is uh, remove the piston return spring and that's actually retained with a fairly light snap ring and as you can see I've used this little spring compressor not much torque actually you could almost push this down with your hand but this makes it a lot easier I got the snap ring started and I just simply unwind it with my hand and out she comes And then just quickly uncoupling the spring compressor. There we see Jacko's idea of a reverse clutch piston return spring. Kind of a slinky like affair. Not that stiff. 
Okay, now I can use shop air to pop the piston out. This one isn't going to require that. But, uh, um, we want to go ahead and remove that piston now because the next snap ring that we get at is going to be rather stout. Okay, here we're ready to go ahead and remove the reverse brake clutch piston and the little shop air is what we need. And up she comes. There we go. Now we have a rather stout tapered snap ring. Now this takes a little bit of doing to go ahead and remove that snap ring. Go ahead and pause. Okay, here we see the center support and the reverse clutch piston housing. And what happens is it's a somewhat stout snap ring. So we need to get our favorite snap ring tool or screwdriver and just very carefully pry it up. So that's what we're doing here. Be careful, don't catch the actual housing. I just want the snap ring. That's all I want. Come on, snap ring. Now we're ready to remove that rather stout tapered snap ring. We want to get our favorite snap ring tool and just simply pick it up. And it's not like this is a 5L40E, so it's not that bad. And just simply grab it, help it out a little bit, and she should come right out. It doesn't take too much. Not that bad. And there she is, and definitely a tapered snap ring. So we of course want to pay attention to that. And again, I don't believe the orientation is really critical, but it was in the down position that his opening was down towards the bottom of the transmission. Now, having removed the center support bolts, my tapered snap ring, give it a little pull and she should come right up. And obviously the orientation is only one way and there we see a Torlon thrust washer and now we move towards the last section and this is the low brake clutch. And there we see its thrust washer Now we'll go ahead and carefully remove the snap ring and then the clutch pack. And this snap ring of course isn't much to it actually. Alright, using your favorite snap ring tool or screwdriver, simply pick up the snap ring and out she comes. Now we'll notice that we have another one of these anti rattle springs just like we had there for the reverse brake clutch pack here we see the low brake another one of those anti rattle springs and you can kind of see how that working what it simply does it just keeps the steels tight against the case so it just keeps it from rattling if you were to leave that out customer might never know it or if he did hear something, he wouldn't know what it was. So it's not something we want to leave out. And I'll go ahead and pick up the clutches now. Friction steel, friction steel. Sometimes your best friend is just simply a stout magnet. Pick it right up. Okay, just simply moving. The friction steel sometimes a little difficult to pick up. Magnet helps. Obviously, I could flip the case upside down, but hey, it's all nice and situated where the camera can see it. And there we see that anti rattle spring right here. 
if we were to leave that out, no one would know that he may have a very fussy customer. They'll say, hey, didn't do that before. What's that sound? And there it is. Now, the actual configuration of the low brake clutch and the reverse brake clutch any rattle spring is different so careful don't swap and now we're back to the dish to fly spring and the bottom of the dish is facing down towards the piston. Okay, the next thing and the last before the case is empty is going to be the, the low brake clutch. And I'm going to have to compress the spring first before I remove the snap ring, so let me assemble my spring compressor. Okay, and now a blast of shop air, and I can go ahead and <coughs> pop out my low brake clutch piston. You'll notice that there is a large and a small area, so there's actually two separate areas. Of course, we've had this apart and carefully inspected and lubricated the O-rings. And now the case is almost completely stripped. The only thing that I'm left with is my manual linkage. And we'll go ahead and leave that alone. Obviously these seals are brand new. If I were going to replace them, obviously I'm going to have to carefully drive out the pin and remove the roll pin. We could do that just with a pair of side cutters very gently just to carefully pry it out without damaging the roll pin and just simply our favorite pin punch and lightly wrap the roll pin to remove it and then slide out the manual linkage. Now the reason why of course it's designed like this is because in Japan they drive on the other side of the road and of course in countries like Thailand and Britain and whatnot they want to drive either on the right hand side or here in America that uh, we drive on the right hand side, they want to drive on the left hand side, etc, etc. Okay, there's our case. Not too bad. A few special tools involved. I believe this is just a straight aluminum. They're certainly using steel bolts. There's no aluminum bolts on this transmission unlike some of the later ZF and Mercedes units that are going through the aluminum magnesium cases. Uh, using the separate bell housing allows me to uh, be very versatile as far as the engine application and obviously with a common case and a different style extension housing I can go between two wheel and four wheel drive applications and obviously my output shaft is going to be in a very different configuration for four-wheel drive. Okay, here we see a JATCO's 7AT transmission. Uh, uh, there are several applications, but one is a favorite, of course, is the uh, Infinity um, line there from Nissan. Designed very similar to the early 5-speed unit. In fact, some of the components right here look almost identical. Obviously, the additional planetary there in the front gives me a 2-speed reduction section versus the 1-speed there for the earlier 5-speed unit. Allows their expanded ratio and seven speeds forward, one in reverse. And one thing you'll notice that the layout of the gear train 
is very similar to the Mercedes 7 speed, the Mercedes 7 G Tronic automatic transmission. All of the thrust bearings are oriented correctly on all of the clutches and everything are correctly indexed. Now it'd be nice if I could lower the case on it, but that's not going to be possible. Because obviously I am retaining several of my clutch packs with snap rings and the center support is retained with our large stout tapered snap ring and of course we don't forget the three T45 bolts.